Hi, everybody. I'm Marv Albert. Now, the year was 1976, our nation in the midst of celebrating the bicentennial. Our American troops had exited Vietnam. Gerald Ford was our president. This was an era before the Internet. There was no CNN, no ESPN or, or TNT, no USA Today. However, professional basketball consisted of two separate leagues. The established National Basketball Association, 30 years in existence and the wild and wacky American Basketball Association, the ABA, whose nine years were legendary due to their folk-like status. Well, at that time, you know, the, the ABA had a lot of anonymity, and the NBA was getting all the pub. Uh, the ABA players, you know, always had a one-for-all-off-one attitude. We would all pull for one another, but uh, when we were got on those black lines, you know, the, the competition was intense. Well, there was a camaraderie. Everybody in the ABA wanted to see it become successful. It gave a lot of young players a chance to develop and be successful. In the NBA, the young players sat on the bench. In our league, the young players made up our league. And they got to develop their skills. It was a more wide open game. The ABA was trying to uh, gain acceptance, uh, trying to take some of the turf away from the NBA, and it was an uphill battle. The NBA had a lot more players, uh, but the ABA was uh, had some unbelievable superstars. But the perception uh, between the two leagues, like the NBA was it, and uh, the ABA was just nothing. The NBA, especially in the early 70s, was still a walk the ball up the court, pounded inside kind of league. And I think the ABA was playing a little more exciting basketball because uh, our better players were forwards and guards, not, not big people. And with the three-point line, it was more of a, a wide open game. In a lot of ways, I thought the ABA had the better young talent. And uh, they played the game uh, the way I really like to play, uh, up and down, uh, above the rim. Uh, spectacular individual player, and you have some good team play. For the 1975-76 season, the ABA was set to start the year with 10 teams. By December, they were down to only seven. How bad was it? For its All-Star game, the league's best team, the Denver Nuggets, would face an ABA All-Star squad because they could not put together enough players for an East versus West matchup. We were playing in smaller cities, and our one last shot at getting uh, acceptance by the basketball world and the sports world generally was to put on a great show at our all-star game and demonstrate to the world what great players we had. So we sat around thinking about what can we do in addition to playing an all-star game, player against player, uh, how can we come up with some type of competition that really uh, showcases the great talent that our league had. If you remember, the ABA was a league of dunkers. Uh, you, the more outlandish, the better off it was. So it, it all kind of fell together with Carl Shear one day calling us and saying, we need something else for this All-Star game. We need to make an impact. And sitting around uh, in an office or a hotel room, not sure where it was, uh, a group of guys, uh, Jim Bucata, myself, uh, Jim was with the league office, Jim Keeler, um, thinking how can we do this you know what do we do well well of course we we dunk the ball and we do it very creatively and very uh, ex with, with a great deal of enthusiasm and excitement let's try to put together a contest to determine who is our best dunker. and uh, that was how it started i thought it would be great you know i was one of the high the leapers in, in the game and I wanted to be able to showcase my skills in the slam dunk competition, so I was all for it. When I knew it was going to be a slam dunk contest in 76, I, I was pretty excited about it. Um, you know, dunking was my forte. We knew it would be a great show. Welcome back to Mile High, legend of the dunk contest. Now, as the ABA used the slam dunk to attract fans and players to its league, the NCAA decided to go the opposite way and ban the slam dunk in 1967 and did not bring it back until nine years later, the same time frame that the ABA existed. 
Utilizing the slam dunk and the hardship rule to recruit numerous players to leave school early, the ABA signed such high flyers as Julius Irving, David Thompson, and George Gervin. On Tuesday night, January 27th, 1976, the league would showcase these talents during the ninth annual All-Star Game. We, we weren't certain that, that this game could put 17,000 people in the old McNichols Arena in Denver and, and create the kind of excitement and environment that we wanted. So we, we weren't confident enough in our own ability to market the game. So we said, well, let's bring a big major concert along with the slam dunk contest. So uh, Carl decided we wanted to make it a little bit more special, a little bit of extravaganza. And we had kind of an odd combination with Glenn Campbell and Charlie Rich. And there was a lot of uh, buzz in the community about it because it hadn't happened before. Oh, don't you make me proud. Carl believed in two things. One, he wanted to fill the building for the All-Star Game. And two, he was always into family entertainment uh, above and beyond basketball. I do remember uh, the concert. I um, actually, I think we stood in the corridor and watched the guys who were players. So we only watched part of it. And it was, it was actually pretty cool. I guess a lot of people came for that, you know, being out in the Midwest, uh, people like that type of music. Uh, I remember we had a Glen Campbell concert. Now that doesn't sound too exciting, but in 1976, Glen Campbell was a pretty big name. Like a we would show you video of Glen Campbell and the Silver Fox from that night, but no known video exists as the concert was not televised. The broadcast of the ABA's finest were only shown in five markets, mostly on independent stations locally in Denver, San Antonio, Indianapolis, St. Louis, and Louisville, all ABA cities. Without the mass media of television to promote their players, the five contestants in the slam dunk contest all merited nicknames to market their impressive skills. Well, David Thompson was uh, Skywalker, Luke Skywalker, uh, along the uh, lines of the Star Wars, very popular then. And uh, David uh, literally would walk in the sky. I mean, he was one guy who could elevate and uh, then in midair go even higher. It looked like he was walking on air. Julius Irving was a doctor, well documented uh, how he operated on the court. George Gervin was uh, the ice man, uh, just as cool as ice. Uh, Larry Keenan was uh, Mr. K, and uh, oh, Artis Gilmore, the A-Train. When he got the ball, he was just the A-Train coming down the line, and there wasn't much you can do with stopping Artis. Good evening, everyone. This huge record-breaking crowd here at McNichols Arena about to bear witness to one of the most spectacular events in professional basketball, the Slam Dunk Contest. It will feature five of the most talented, colorful players in basketball, all with a flair for that sensational slam dunk. With these words by my brother Al, the slam dunk contest was introduced. And now to introduce the five participants. For judges, a longtime Nuggets fan, Alberta Worthington, would be one of four to preside sitting courtside as Artis Gilmore began the competition. We had Artis Gilmore, and that was a mistake because he was already 7-1, and he couldn't add a lot of flair to the, his dunks. And then we had uh, George Garvin. No, I think I did all right. I mean, you know, I didn't think I did anything spectacular to be considered one of the winners. But, you know, I could dunk the basketball. I could dunk it with ease. But, you know, I was kind of known for finger roll. <laughs> Gervin replaced Marvin Bad News Barnes, who sat out due to a neck injury. Next up, Larry Keenan of the San Antonio Spurs, who at 6'9", showed power and creativity in his performance. Even though there were a lot of guys in that first slam dunk contest that, that could do some remarkable things, I think everybody knew that it would eventually come down to David and, and to Julius. Welcome back to Mile High, Legend of the Dunk Contest. One of the key factors to the ABA's merger with the NBA was the high-flying artistry and drawing power of Julius Irving and David Thompson. 
a rookie in 1976 after signing with Denver over the NBA's Atlanta Hawks, Thompson's credits included a national championship at North Carolina State. As for the doctor, he was the ABA, a two-time most valuable player and all ABA for each of his five seasons. Julius Irving is, is the most phenomenal player I've ever seen. The temptation was to just kind of stop and watch Julius play, because he did some things that were, I mean, unbelievable. He'd do it, and you'd be running back down to the court to the offensive end thinking, did I just see what I saw? I remember sitting on the bench, and three or four times a night, saying to myself, I can't believe he just did that. You know, he would do something that other players can't do. Uh, he was that type athlete. And he did it night after night after night. And it was, it was a joy just to sit there and watch that guy play. David, everybody realized what a special player he was in college. Coming into our league was a huge feather in the ABA. The two remaining, David Thompson and Dr. J. And here is the Denver Nuggets, David Thompson. In the first dunk, you had to do right up near the basket. What I did was uh, just a straight up power dunk. Dumped it like three times behind the head and uh, dumped it into the basket. And I thought that was pretty decent. DT was the kind of guy that had the frog jump, where he jumped off two legs all the time, but you know, he can take a dime off the top of the backboard. My second dunk was, I think it was probably the one where we had to take off from beyond 12 feet. Uh, Instead of doing a regular dunk, I cupped it and did a tomahawk windmill dunk, which was was pretty pretty good. My momentum carried me into the backboard. Thought that was a pretty good dunk. I got up pretty high and added a little extra to it. I've never seen anybody for his size be able to get in the air uh, like David could. My third dunk, I think, was the one where I went baseline, put the ball up to the rim, balled up in midair. I dunked over my shoulder, and I really liked that dunk. Got good response from the crowd, and uh, you know that was that was a real good dunk. A double pop, David Thompson. Nobody was that explosive as David. No one was that quick, and he jumped so fast and so high. My fourth dunk was the one where I made a critical mistake. Uh, I went baseline. I tapped the ball off the backboard, and I was bringing around and dunk backward. And, for some reason, when I hit it off the backboard, I maybe hit, hit it maybe a little bit too hard. When I went to dunk, I was a little bit off center, and the ball went down and rattled out. And so <laughs> I thought, man, I'm in trouble now. I missed one. So on my last dunk, I, I saved my specialty. I went baseline and did a complete 360 dunk, two hands, and got a good height, and dunked it in real clean. I was pretty impressed with the dunks I did and pretty pleased, except that one dunk I missed, I knew that was probably going to hurt. It would have been tight because even if David had made that dunk, uh, the fact that, that Julius had, and uh, before the contest, it had kind of gotten around that Julius was going to try a dunk taking off from the free throw line. Dr. J had a certain presence about him. I mean, we had great dunkers and, and very creative guys, but when when Doc picked up the ball, there was a hush in the crowd. It was just, it was magical. Doc, and now the doctor goes to work. When he started running back into the back court, I mean, there are people looking around, where is he going? Uh, you know, I mean, did, uh, you know, did he lose his contacts back there? Is he leaving, going to the bathroom? You know, he's just stopped at the other end of the floor, and everybody got so excited when they, you know, understood what he was uh, now looking to uh, attempt to do. So he marked off his steps. He took off running up a lot of speed, a lot of steam. His afro was blowing in the wind. Well, I remember he had a big afro and his hair was just flying in the back and he just dunked it. So he ran the length of the court and took off of the foul line. He actually went into the air, appeared to be in slow motion, but at the same time, picking up speed 
going towards the basket and then just dunked it with such force. There seemed to be a molecular reaction to it and it drove everybody out of their seats. And that sends everyone really. Julius Irving. He took up and soared in the air and made a spectacular dunk. And just the crowd went crazy. The players went wild, uh, jumping up and giving each other high fives. And uh, after he did that dunk, I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I think if I just jumped from that hash mark or wherever the white line was, like everybody else did, there wouldn't have been a dis distinct difference. Maybe I could have jumped a little higher or did something tricky on the way, and that would have brought risk into it. But I'm jumping farther out. You know, that had an impact. And I, and I had seen that before. Uh, with people young and old alike, you know, who just like to see brothers fly. <laughs> it was just incredible um, to see the end result. Uh, Doug Moe to this day said he stepped over the line. Um, I just thought it was a spectacular dunk. Doug Moe was going around betting everybody. He said it can't be done, that it's physically impossible to take off from the free throw line and, and dunk the basketball. It was funny because Kevin Lockery and Rod Thorne had said that Dr. J can dunk from the foul line. And I said, nobody can dunk from the foul line. So I said, it's not possible, and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll bet you a certain amount of money. You can go back and practice Dr. J for two weeks. You can see. If you want to come back and bet, I'll still bet you, because I don't think you can do it. And uh, they came back, they called the bet off. But the foul line one was, was the one that involved the leap, the timing, the sequence, and then the punctuation point. And the punctuation is when you, know, you create the vacuum in the room. And people just say, I can practice all I want, but I ain't gonna do that. <laughs> I think uh, in a surreal way, you know, you look at it uh, like the Wright brothers, Charles Lindbergh, John Glenn. Uh, I think the fans witnessed there the first solo flight of its kind. Even after his flight from the free throw line, the doctor would need to complete three more dunks before he would be crowned a champion. Irving and the four other contestants would share a total of nearly $1,200 in prize money. However, all was not lost for David Thompson. His second half performance in the All-Star Game would lead the Nuggets to a 144-138 victory over Irving and the ABA All-Stars. And Thompson would capture the MVP award. I described that night in 76 as one of the great nights for me in professional basketball history. Uh, it was one of those days and nights where everything came together. It was one truly one of the great moments, I think, in, in event history in Colorado, certainly, and, and I think in the ABA's history. you got to give Carl credit. Um, his vision was something special. There'll never be a slam dunk contest to rival that one. You know, I know Michael and Dominique and all, you know, Spud and, you know, all these other guys that are such high flyers. I, I'm amazed at the things they're able to do, but nothing will ever rival that. Because I don't, I don't think you'll ever have two guys quite like David and Doc. I think that night was the ABA infomercial. And uh, I think it really had something to do with the acceleration of the merger. These guys were on the platform that night, and I think the NBA recognized that some of the best young talent in basketball is now playing in the ABA. Within six months, the ABA would merge with the NBA, and four teams of the seven, the Nuggets, the Pacers, the Spurs, and the Nets, would join the established league, putting an end to a memorable nine-year run of the ABA.